Felix here. Good morning from Hong Kong or good evening to you, depending on where you are in the world, guys. Thanks very much for tuning in. Uh, what a day we have had, right? Quite the roller coaster. So we started uh, looking, you know, opening the market was rather bleak and then things really have turned around. Uh, so what did the Fed actually say? Why have the market reacted that way? And of course, we can look at our favorite stocks. We can look at the charts and we can see what is to come is are we now going to see you know a new big tech rally is that what's going to happen well let, let's get into all of that guys as always there's not financial advice just for entertainment only and if you know me you also know that for every one of your likes guys i donate one cent to the gentle pan here uh, we reached 308 us dollars last month for for donations uh, from me here that's so that's for, for you know those likes really adding up so uh, let's keep that going guys uh, that'll be fun now we can have a quick look here at just what's going on with the market um let me welcome a couple of you guys on here jackson esteban glenn uh, dixon uh, easy stocks great to see you ha uh, on here when you think neo will hit 50 okay well we look at we look at the neo chart uh, we'll we'll do that and we'll see you know what has changed since yesterday here um Flecker, uh, good to have you on the chat here. Uh, I've also got a couple of new sources up here. So if something very interesting breaks, I will definitely uh, let you guys know as we're looking at this. Uh, look at this beautiful map. This is our map yesterday. Uh, everything green, pretty much, uh, with a few exceptions uh, that are dark green. PDD, actually, they put out really good numbers. They now have more uh, active users than Alibaba. Yes, they do, hard to believe, but it is true. Um, but why are they down? Well, the, uh, their, their founder has basically stepped down uh, and people don't like that. The people don't like the sort of key people who made a business stepping down because they're now billionaires. Uh, so uh, that is not uh, the only one of the really the very few ones that are really stuck out here uh, on that list. If we have a quick look also at our stock screener, we're looking at yesterday. Remember we looked at this yesterday, the whole thing was basically red. Um, Palantir is still end of the day up in the red for, for inexplicable reasons, but there we are. Uh, volatility is down and um, we have PDD at the bottom here and plug, uh, plug having accounting discrepancies. Now we are assured that these are small discrepancies, but I think I am um, of the sentiment like a lot of people there. Uh, you hear the word accounting discrepancy in a listed company, run is, is what I say, unless you really think in the long run, you know, they are going to gonna really save the world or something. But that there we are in Coupang uh, down quite substantially uh, down eight percent i do think they're listed at prices that were um well ambitious i would say i think ambitious is probably the right word for that to put it politely so uh, what else is going on here in the market um, anything else that sticks out you can see palantir down a little bit uh, microsoft apple google down a fraction well why well we saw the day before basically money was fleeing into these uh, stocks who were deemed safer the bank still had, had managed to have a good day so higher interest rates obviously being uh, positive uh, for the banks guys here. So um, I think overall, uh, looking rather good. Austin saying, Baba breaks losing streak. Yes, absolutely. One of the brightest lights here on the map is Alibaba. Though Alibaba, of course, coming from a, from a pretty low uh, starting point. So 2.83% isn't quite what we need. We need a lot more than that. Um, no apparent clear catalyst of why Barber went up like that while PDD and JD were having a bad day. Uh, maybe that's why. Maybe people think that they benefit from that. Um, I, I can't quite interpret that. And maybe there was something in the PDD results that people uh, made people more bullish or made people read that actually Alibaba would therefore also benefit because the market does somewhat move together. Uh, but what's also really lovely to see, of course, guys, Tesla up, Neo up, um, the auto down a little bit, uh, strangely enough. Uh, but XPang also up a little bit. Most of the EV sector here uh, looking rather, rather green. And they are, of course, thinking, well, you know, the party is continuing, uh, given what the Fed was talking about. Uh, what was the Fed talking about, really? Well, what did he really say? He basically acknowledged, yes, we are going to have a higher economic growth. We are going to get inflation up to 2%. But we are not going to act preemptively. I think that's really the big break there. He's basically saying the old Fed policy of acting preemptively to uh, stop inflation, uh, we are not going to do anymore. And, and what's the theory behind that? Well, economic theory basically tells you that if you raise interest rates now, the, the effect of it kicks in maybe 12 to 18 months later. So that's why central banks in the past, when inflation was a concern, have always acted well in advance of inflation uh, rearing its head. Uh, they are saying, well, we're not going to do that anymore. Um, we simply won't. We were going to wait for it to actually show up before we'll do anything. And the market seems to be buying it because we saw that massive turnaround. And if you look at the chart, if I guess I'm a little bit of the day, but let's look at Neo you know, on, the, on a minute by minute basis. 
And you can see yesterday, when did the, uh, uh, here, here we go. So let me show you the whole day, guys. So you can see the glory of yesterday, yesterday 17th. So the day starts uh, here, we're putting that, whoops, wrong line. Uh, we're putting in that green line here. That's basically the beginning of the day, right? Uh, sell off, sell off, we're going sideways. And then he started speaking at 2 p.m. and pretty much immediately, uh, at least sort of half an hour into it, you know, we see a massive, massive recovery here. Uh, so very, very much uh, the Fed making markets at the moment. This is not to do with the fundamentals of the companies. Nothing has really changed here intraday. It is just uh, the, the, the Fed uh, keeping us happy with our daily injection of, of, of stimulus basically so um, you know therefore is, is this whole rally going to continue well I think I think there is a very very good chance of it yes absolutely I think uh, the tech sector is going to love this uh, there is we are still going to see somewhat rising interest rates uh, and that will still spook us a little bit uh, but it'll only spook us to the extent that it basically reduces the um, present value of future earnings of, uh, of tech companies and yes that does have have um, an impact on, on, on valuations but in the, uh, it's not as big a deal as if the Fed was going to act on top of that and actually raise rates, and then we'd get significant rate rises. Uh, you know, where, where did we stop uh, yesterday with our um, uh, bond yield? Yesterday, where's the ten-year bond yield? Here it is. Uh, it was at one point six three nine. It was at, at the beginning of the day. It was at one point six seven. So it's actually uh, down quite a bit uh, throughout the day. In fact, it's down on the day minus point oh four three percent. Uh, so that is a rather happy outcome. And in fact, all of the US government bonds are, are, are down, or the longer term ones, uh, only the very short, the one and two months ones are, are up quite a bit. But uh, the long term ones are all down. And that is pleasing to see, at least for the tech sector, guys. So um, uh, Jeremy is saying, any upcoming Apple news? Uh, can it run? Well, we can, we can have a look at Apple if you like. Uh, we can, uh, let me pull open here uh, our, um, I think we do it on the Palantir chart. I think we do Apple. So we can have a quick look at Apple, uh, see what's going on there. APPL, here we go. Um, so from a, um, here you can see my, my, my technical analysis from before the day uh, yesterday, and we are still moving in that blue uh, uh, band here, that sort of growth trajectory. Uh, you can see that we had a pretty volatile day because you can see how tall and thin that candle is, right? So we moved up quite a bit, down quite a bit, and then we found our way back in the middle. Now in the background there, you can see that little turquoise and that little blue line almost touching. If they cross, you get a buy signal, basically. The 5 and, and 20 day moving average lines crossing, it would give us a nice buy signal. So that could happen in the next trading day, provided we move up just a fraction here. Um, even moving sideways would probably get us there, you know, down yesterday 0.65%. So I think that would be a, an interesting catalyst. It might bring us a little bit higher. Um, I think real um, resistance is lying here at, uh, at about 127 and 128. Um, that's really where we need to break through. Uh, yesterday, we managed to go up as high as uh, 125, but it was an unusual day. So uh, I would say the real resistance here lies at... Uh, uh, 127 and then 128, 129. So uh, we need to break through that basically uh, to really uh, keep keep this, this rally coming. Uh, big volume yesterday, so though that, that that's fairly good to see. Uh, although we are moving slightly downwards, but you know bigger volume is is, is a more likely to give us that kind of rally. Um, uh, Jackson says, any good news on the fundamentally for the company Neo today? Jackson, welcome to the chat here. Well. And Neo, I had a look this morning also on, on the Chinese media. Honestly, there isn't anything particularly massive on, on, on Neo out uh, in, in, in terms of news. So no, I, I don't think there is a, a huge news story on, on Neo today. If there is, of course, guys, I'll put it out later today in, the, in, in, in a video. Uh, so make sure you are subscribed and that way you get to see it. Uh, but what's happening with Neo here at the moment? So yesterday, again, we have, you can see the candle here, it's a pretty tall candle. Uh, so we means you know, we moved up and down quite a lot. Um, but actually, yeah, quite a nice day, two and a half percent up. Um, the not a new high um, and, and a new low. So that from that point of view, it's not the greatest day, but I think the recovery is very, very good to see. Uh, so we touched down here yesterday at our support line at uh, uh, 41.12. That's what that red one is there. That is 41.12. Uh, and then we managed to go up uh, all the way up to almost the next um, resistance line, which is sitting at 4531. And that's that uh, little green faint line uh, here. Uh, so we're going to have to break through that. And that also happens to be the 20-day uh, moving average. And again, you can see that little blue line, that's the five-day moving average and the red one 
almost touching. If they cross, we get a buy signal here. So this is on a day by day basis. If you look at this on a four hour basis, they probably have already crossed. So I think that could be a good catalyst here. Uh, volume yesterday picking up, which is good to see um, on a buy day. You want high volume, what this great big green arrow is pointing out here. So that is all looking rather, rather happy, really, rather positive. The Williams are also let me just delete that uh, line here. It gave us a buy signal. Uh, you can see that here uh, on the was it, 10th of March or so. Uh, and that is still valid. So we are still, uh, you know, moving up. Uh, momentum finding its footing again yesterday, uh, rallying back up in, in that direction. So that is, is positive momentum uh, continuing here. So, yeah, I think I think from a momentum point of view, from a technical point of view, uh, this is looking looking pretty um, chirpy, absolutely. MACD also 12th of March buy signal. And you can see the volume here, the positive momentum in those green bars getting bigger and bigger uh, day by day. So this is looking really, really pretty good. I think I think we are here on a firmer footing. Actually, the zigzagging has given us some, some real support. Uh, we now have lots and lots of support lines. Um, we are above... Uh, the 4277 support, we are above the 4626 support. Uh, we are, in fact, even above, um, yeah, so, so you know, we are uh, basically, um, we need to basically now break through 4546 and then, you know, we will we'll keep flying. Uh, that is essentially what the chart is saying at the moment. Um, always subject, of course, to, you know, what, what, what Tesla is up to uh, because Tesla really, really matters for the EV sector. Uh, Tesla yesterday having a good day also. Let me get rid of some of these pink points there. I don't know what they are about. Uh, you can see similar candle actually for Tesla yesterday. It um, it fell below some of the support that we had at 654. Um, it, it just got caught at sort of six, uh, six, just 650. Uh, 650 again is a big psychological point for, for, for uh, Tesla from my perspective here. Uh, and then we managed to end up uh, pretty much on the high yesterday. Um, almost as high as the previous day's opening not quite but almost only sort of four dollars down or so on where we opened the day before um where is uh, tesla's next move well if this positive move continues we basically uh, might find our way back up to sort of uh, 713 719 which are these uh, support uh, sorry rather resistance points that i've, I've put in here so uh that's kind of what we need to get to. Uh, although, first of all, we need to break through that high of yesterday, of course, it was a 703, but that's such a tiny movement. I don't think that is really the issue in itself. Um, now, we are not part of this real rapid trajectory anymore. We have moved out a little bit. Uh, so I, I am going to uh, take this one out. But we are still on a, a, a broadly speaking, a positive um, direction here because we really, uh, you know, ended up the day yesterday very, very nicely. And let's have a quick look at some of the indicators, guys. Uh, Williams are. So, yeah, you, know, so you can see here the momentum story uh, looking very, very nice. In, in, indeed, still, we are still moving very neatly in that direction. And that is uh, kind of better than what we've seen for quite some time, quite frankly. So uh, that is very, very good momentum that we're seeing here. And I suspect other, other indicators will, will confirm that. Yeah, there we go. MACD also uh, on the 11th of March, getting that buy signal here. And then you can see basically momentum increasing. Each day, those green bars are dark and they're slightly bigger than the next day. So EV sector looking pretty happy, I, I, I must say. And I think Tesla and NEO together are essentially uh, the EV sector. So, um, do we break through 45 tomorrow? Is, uh, Glenn is asking, let's have another quick look at Neo, guys. Uh, do we? Um, I, I think it's, it's, it's very possible. Uh, really, if, if we do that, I think you pretty much get these uh, two moving average lines crossing. That'll give you a buy signal. Um, there isn't actually a great deal of resistance to get to 45 uh, from, from my perspective. Uh, that is a relatively small move. Um, there is some resistance on Fibonacci here at 45.31. And so you know, that, that, that might be one thing to test. And that is that uh, faint green line here in the background, which is also the MA um, moving average 20 day line. So yeah, I think, I think we can certainly do that. We did it yesterday, we, we, were, we broke through it, uh, you know, and then of course we closed down uh, lower. I mean, yesterday, the trading day before uh, this one. And so we have been up there. We've been consolidating around that line. I've basically been saying, guys, that uh, I think we are going to move in this sort of a purplish range here, which is sort of between 42.75 and 46. Uh, that's what I was saying, I think, two days ago or so. Uh, and at the moment, that is kind of uh, holding. But I think we have a real chance to break through here. I think we have a good chance to break through uh, the 45 line. And that will, I think, establish itself as a good support again, uh, subject to Tesla, as always. The tech sector is looking, looking very good, Jasper. I, I agree with you there. 
Um, Lily, what's the current situation with bond yields? Great to have you on the chat again, Lily. Um, where are our bond yields? Here are the American bond yields. So these are all the American bonds and basically all the long term ones. Um, one year up uh, are down on the day. So that's very, very nice to see, right? They're down 3%, uh, 1%, etc. And the 10 year one, which we worried about yesterday, but yesterday as we were watching this sat at uh, 1.67 or so in the morning is now sitting here at uh, 1.639 down almost half a percent on the day. So what Powell said really worked. And I think it was quite a clever strategy really here that he had out uh, to basically say, well, look, we are breaking with tradition. We are going to, we are no longer be uh, proactively fighting inflation, essentially, which is what central banks have always done uh, ever since I, uh, you know, studying economics. Uh, so he's basically saying, yes, there will be 2% inflation, but we're not going to do anything about it. And people wouldn't normally believe him on that. But by, by him saying, Look, we are no longer preemptively fighting inflation. We're going to wait for it to arrive before we might do anything about it. That buys in quite a lot of time because people are not really expecting inflation to rise above two percent for 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 you know quite a lot of years. Uh, the econ economists, economists rather in the U.S. Uh, if for for 2023, 2024, 2025, essentially are all expecting two percent. So um, no one's expecting five percent or ten percent inflation, and I think that kind of takes the. Uh, this real firepower out of this 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 bond yield uh, rally that people were kind of jumping up and down and going oh my god it's going to go up like mad and it doesn't look like it is uh, and I, I I've been saying for 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 weeks I don't think there's inflation coming because the stimulus goes into assets it goes into financial assets it doesn't go into you know household incomes uh, so therefore um, actually this is this is yeah so very very nice what he's saying there Carlin great to have you on the chat here. Um, uh, Ethan, can the Fed be trusted on the predictions for interest rates? Many U.S. business owners are expecting inflation, which has to be passed on to the consumer at some point. Ethan, look, I can see why people expect it because economic theory teaches us that. It basically says if you increase, you know, M2 money supply, uh, then uh, you know that that will go up. And if you look at um, I can, you know, we can, I can show you M2 on here. If you look at the M2 money supply, then um, well. Look, look at that, it basically goes up pretty much uh, vertically. Can you see see that massive, massive kink there? Uh, that is a, a big deal, uh, the way that that um, accelerates. It's the dotted line, actually, not the moving average lines, but they are basically all moving in, in the same way. So it has been accelerating incredibly quickly, and people are concerned about that. Uh, however, I think what people need to realize is that this money does not go into people's pockets. Uh, now, the stimulus does to some extent. So here, let me just make this a line, guys. Um, and we could also add to it M2 uh, velocity. Now, what is velocity? Uh, well, um, we've got Tesla on here for unknown reasons. Now, the orange one is, so the blue one is the amount of money printed, right? And the orange one is the velocity. That basically measures how quickly this money is spent and turned around in the real economy. And it isn't. You can see that falling off. More money, but less uh, money velocity. So that money isn't going into people's pockets. They're not going to Starbucks with it or Walmart and spending it. It basically is flowing directly into financial assets, into stocks and, 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 and all sorts of things, uh, real estate and, and bonds and, uh, and, and I suppose crypto. Um, and it isn't therefore having a real impact in the real economy. So I, I just think this concern about inflation is, is it's based on the economic theory that we were taught, but that theory never doesn't really apply anymore um, because at the same time, we basically have all of the goods that we buy are getting cheaper. Uh, why are they getting cheaper? Well, it's, um, it's basically manufacturing, right? It's making everything cheaper. Uh, trade and manufacturing is essentially making goods uh, cheaper than ever. So I, I, I just think from my perspective, guys, I don't expect inflation. Uh, I mean, no, no, no serious inflation. It'd actually be good for the US economy to get 2% inflation, I think, because it, it removes the deflation risk, which is, I think, uh, what is the real concern here. But yeah, thanks very much for that question there. Um, you second Palantir, Jackson. Well, there we go. I'm, I'm pulling it open so I can read your mind, Jackson. Um, th uh, thanks for the fish, by the way. Uh, um, what's going on here with Palantir? Let's zoom in a little bit on this so we can see this a little bit better. Um, and uh, I need a candle chart. Why are the candles important? Well, they tell us a lot more than a line. And I think that's really the, the short answer here. They tell you the highs and the lows in form of those little thin lines, and they tell you the opens and the closes. So Palantir, one of the few stocks yesterday that actually managed to sell off in the tech sector, which is um, yeah, slightly regrettable. 
Uh, however, uh, we did uh, go down yesterday fairly low, but you sort of almost retested that blue line here, that support line, which I've got in here at 24.22 or thereabouts. We almost went down on that. So we actually built some support, which is something positive. Um, and however, uh, I'm putting a, a, a sugar coating this, aren't I really? Uh, of course, we are down. Um, and um, really, um, at the moment, what's momentum looking like? Um, we got a that, that buy signal that we got from the moving average line seemed to have sort of had no impact. It fizzled out. People didn't seem to pay any attention. I'm not really quite sure why. Palantir seems to be moving a little bit in, in, in mysterious ways, almost like Alibaba. It just it's like people people have sort of a, a political view hanging over the stock. So what's momentum doing here? Well, we got a very nice buy signal here on the 10th of March. And if you're wondering why, basically when you cross this horizontal line here, this, oops, that's a bit high. Uh, that horizontal red line here, which is meant to be at, at 50 um, on, the, on this Williams R scale, or minus 50 rather, that gives you the, the, the buy signal here. So um, you are then moving up very nicely. Uh, you, you, we move into overbought territory, which is the territory above this dotted line here. That's overbought. And now we are fizzling out again a little bit. It's not a sell signal. Sell signal to me would be when we cross that line again. We haven't done that. Uh, but it isn't sort of, at this point, it isn't showing a real uh, sustained rally here there. Uh, yesterday also volumes were fairly high at 77 million. That is not great on a sell-off day. You'd rather have low volumes on a sell-off day. Whereas when we had um, rally days here, volumes were actually lower for some of them. So um, uh, yeah, so there, there is there is that. Uh, you guys are saying here, the CEO spoke, absolutely, he did, he did a presentation in Chicago. Um, and uh, you think he's a bit weird. Well, yeah, he is. He, he, I mean, he's, he's a tech guy, right? He's a software chap. Um, I quite like his no-nonsense approach. He basically says it like he like he means it. And, and he isn't sort of putting any real spin on it. I quite like the fact that he doesn't um, jump up and down and promise us, you know, the promised land. He's basically just saying, look, this is what we're doing. I think we're the best. We're fantastic. If you don't like it, go somewhere else. Uh, that's basically what he's saying. Maybe that's what some people did yesterday. They took him, him, him literally. He's basically saying, uh, you have to buy Palantir for the long haul. Uh, don't buy this for the short run. Don't buy it for speculation. We don't want you if you're buying it for, for speculation. So um, there we are here. Actually, so momentum on um, Palantir here is still positive. We're still in a buy trajectory here, but it's fizzling out just a little. So you have to keep an eye on that. You see that these green bars, when they go lighter in color, they become a little bit smaller. So the positive momentum here declining a, a, a little bit. Um, now, we do have a fairly good support now at sort of just over $24. Um, that is, is positive. And, and that is why, well, I can show you that here. You see the blue line basically the, the purple arrow here points to a low that hits that blue line that builds support. There's another purple arrow that hits that blue line here that builds support. And then um, yesterday we actually did the same thing again here. So we're building more support around that 24, um, 20 or thereabouts line. So uh, that's kind of the positive, only positive takeaway from that yesterday. I was a little disappointed that Palantir was one of the very few uh, non-performers here in our, our list. If you look at uh, this is sort of the core list of stocks that I look at and... Um, uh, most of it was actually green from the tech sector yesterday, of course, um, even, you know, the banks were, were green. We add, the, the banks, I, I've added them in here to sort of get a feel for whether how much money is, is moving into banks. Um, GameStop uh, almost to zero, which is actually quite pleasing to see, I must say, because it's good for the market. Uh, and then very few stocks are actually down. And one of them is, of course, Palantir here. Uh, which is, um, yeah, no particular reason for it, really. It's just momentum fizzling out a little bit here. Now, I can see you guys shouting out Barber and Neo. Absolutely, we'll, we'll talk about that. Uh, Zuckerberg Gates uh, hold the, the weird tech uh, titles. Uh, um, what did I miss, Felix? I know, well, it depends on what, when you just tuned in. Basically, uh, due to a quick recap, the Fed managed to convince markets yesterday that they have changed policy. Uh, and the policy change is simply this. They are no longer preemptively fighting inflation. And in the past, central banks have always done that. Why? Because if you raise interest rates, it takes somewhere between 12 to 18 months for that to actually reduce inflation. That's sort of the economic theory that I was taught. Um, and therefore, generally speaking, when interest rates are expected to come up in, say, two years, um, the Fed might then act now. And he's just said we are no longer, uh, we are breaking with that um, tradition of uh, fighting uh, inflation in, you know, in, in advance. We're just not going to do it anymore. And um, people believe it. 
Uh, and, and you see you see that very very clearly if you look at you know we had a quick look just on the neo day chart here and uh, look at it on, on a minute by minute uh, basis uh, and you can basically see uh, he opened his mouth at two o'clock uh, and, and, and see what happened here right you know two o'clock and we you know we, we do this uh, so that's the power of the Fed. Uh, and they're also saying that they're not going to change policy, right? They're going to keep printing money. They're going to keep buying assets. And therefore, they're going to keep sustaining and supporting this rally. Uh, and, and, you know, he, he basically thinks we need to be cautious on, on the economic recovery rather than on, um, on worrying about inflation. And quite frankly, I can see his point uh, because we haven't had inflation for many, many years, despite huge amounts of quantitative easing. Uh, the only issue I have with quantitative easing is that they are not really measuring that as part of inflation, right? They're not measuring it at all because they're only measuring stuff that we are spending on a day-to-day -day basis. They are not measuring asset prices. Uh, so we are seeing asset inflation. Now, there is an interesting comment yesterday, maybe the day before, where one of the big Saudi uh, um, or, or Arab um, funds who are basically saying, look, we can't compare evaluations now to valuations in 2000 or even 2008 because so much more retail money is now on the market because retailers you know we now have access or through our um, phones and various apps and, 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 and margins and all sorts and that isn't just American investors that's uh, investors all around the world in Europe and in India all these people now have more money and they can in, in invest it and therefore actually uh, multiples and, and, and valuations will be higher because there's more demand it's supply and demand right demand is simply higher there is more uh, money uh, in, in the market than there, ha there ever has been and, it's, and, and I think that's an interesting way of looking at it that we can't sort of compare like for like uh, the valuations I can see his point so, um, uh, once you drink water like that on live TV, there's no going back, uh, says Austin uh, Davis. Okay, I, was, it, was, it, was it my, my very dramatic uh, water drinking, was it? What does it mean to you, Austin? <laughs> um, uh, has anyone heard about bank reserve ratios changing? Um, Glenn, I, I don't believe there are. No, I don't think that they have changed that. Uh, I think that decision is coming out in about three weeks. Um, I think uh, Powell said that they haven't looked at that yet. Uh, you know, banks have also been uh, prevented from buying buybacks and, and dividends, uh, basically to build up their, their, their capital. And uh, he said yesterday that they um, are presently doing the next stress test uh, they did the last one in December, and he said that was good. Uh, but they are doing the next one here on sort of uh, you know worse, potentially worse depression conditions, and uh, that I think decision is going to come out in a couple of weeks. So, um, um, uh, Foxhound is saying um, uh, that bond yields are going up the fastest rate in ten years. Um, well, yes, they are going up. Absolutely, uh, you are totally right. And we can have a quick look at at bond yields uh, just to see what's what's going on here, really. Let me just hide some of our um, indicators here. So that little dotted line there in the back, let me make it a line, is, this the, is the 10 year bond yield, right? Uh, if you go back um, a, a, a long period in time, um, well, uh, I think you know, you'll see that over a longer period of time, our bond yields are pretty low. Uh, so this is basically 10 years now, right? From, from 2011 onwards. Um, is it the fastest one ever? I, I think probably not. I think 2013 here uh, looks uh, looks pretty steep. Um, you, and you see that in recoveries, right? 2016, you know, it went up very steeply. A little bit less steep in 2018, perhaps, um, than, than it is right now. So relatively, our bond yields are very low. But you are you are totally right, Foxhound. I, I, I appreciate what you're saying. Uh, people are concerned about the pace of acceleration. Uh, and, and let me... Um, show you that a little bit on a more dramatic scale. So uh, this is what we were doing, uh, you know, until sort of early Feb. Um, and then since early February, uh, we are going up at this trajectory here. And that has people slightly concerned. Uh, the, sorry, the, the red line there in the background is, is the moving day average line, 20, 20 days. So it sort of moves, you know, it illustrates a little bit of the, tra the trajectory there as well. Uh, it's the speed that we're just going up. Now, yesterday, we actually, our bond yields went, uh, uh, well, according to this, they went sideways, but they certainly were intraday at up at 1.67 and, and we closed the day, um, you know, quite a bit lower than that. So uh, 1.62, according to this, I don't know if that's 100% accurate. Uh, this one here says 1.639. I'm minded to believe the 1.639, quite frankly. 
uh, than, uh, than, than this particular chart here. So that is exactly the concern. If that continues to go up at that rate, you know, we are going to hit 2% uh, by, well, if we draw it out like that, you know, we are going to hit 2% by April. Uh, now, is that going to happen? Well, I think it probably will go above 2% and then, and then down again. Uh, however, I do think that what the Fed said yesterday is uh, important for the impact of this. So there, there are two things to it, right? There are There is this interest rate and then there is the actual interest rate that the Fed sets. And if we believe that the Fed would increase interest rates, then this rate will go up faster uh, and that will hurt tech stocks um, most, or well, growth stocks most, really, and, and the, the fastest growing stocks the most. What he was saying yesterday is that, look, we are not going to preemptively fight inflation, basically means he bought himself some time uh, and, and he gained some credibility uh, by, by announcing a policy change rather than just sort of saying, we're not going to do anything, we're going to keep doing what we're doing. So I think it was quite a clever tactic and how he's presented that, uh, that we are, we are going to continue with that. Um, uh, right, guys, PLT out to the moon, Marco. Uh, absolutely, I'm with you on that one. Um, uh, Lakito here, Facebook. Okay, do you want to look at Facebook? We can do that. Um, I did a uh, tech analysis yesterday on most of the big tech stocks. I don't think I did Facebook, though. No, I don't think I did. Uh, what's going on with Facebook here? Well, very nice rally. So essentially, okay, to me, I, I like Facebook. I hold some Facebook, uh, but I, I, I think it's a value stock. I don't think it's a tech stock anymore. Uh, I think it is a defensive play, to be honest with you. And I think that is actually uh, why Facebook has enjoyed uh, this, this, this kind of channel here that we are moving in. Um, basically, you know, we're moving in, in, in this sort of direction because people, more money is pouring into it out of tech, uh, out of real tech in, in, into, into Facebook here. Uh, you can also see we got the, the moving average lines crossing here in the background, the five and the 20 day ones. That gives us a buy signal uh, that was on the 11th of March. So uh, momentum looking very, very positive on this. I think yesterday up 1.69%. Um, testing as high as uh, 286 and then pulling back a little bit. So uh, why is that? Well, there's a Fibonacci line up here and you can maybe just about make that out. Let me uh, highlight what it is. You see that gray line up here? That is sitting at 286.79. So that's the next one to kind of break through. Uh, that was, of course, also the high point uh, from the end of January. So that's kind of what we need to break through here to kind of recover a little bit. Uh, the stock was zigzagging very nicely, though, which gives us a lot, give it, gives it lots of support. And therefore, it isn't sort of subject to, you know, five or 10 percent movements up and down. We can have a quick look at some of the indicators here. Uh, RSI yeah, giving us a nice buy signal here. Let me just put in a horizontal line here. It gave us a nice buy signal on the 10th of March also. Um, basically here and it's been been flying ever since you can you can see that here right it's just sort of going off in that direction which is good very good to see and i'm pretty sure uh, macd will tell us a similar story absolutely giving us a buy signal on the 9th of march a little bit earlier in fact here uh, and then uh, can you see these green bars that's a momentum uh, building basically so they are getting bigger and bigger every single day so uh, facebook i think i think it's a good story i think it can go up is it going to go you know 10x no it's not it's far far too mature a company it's basically an advertising platform uh, i think i think that's really really all it is at, at, at this point it is no longer um you know a sort of disruptive kind of a tech super growth story but it is a safe a play where basically people have to spend advertising money on Facebook. Uh, there really is, is almost no, no way around it. And very interesting to watch this battle about privacy between Google and Facebook at the moment. Uh, that is kind of an interesting one. Everyone trying to uh, fight for their corner and their interests. So thanks very much, Fox Sound there. Appreciate your, your kind comment. Um, uh, Felix, prior to the recent volatility, you were looking at value equity. Thoughts on now? Are you interested in, in Berkshire or other value stocks, ETFs beyond Fundsmith? CP is asking. And I, I like that you put that bracket in there because you think he's just going to throw Fundsmith out at you. And and and, and I, I do. Um, I, I I do look at value plays. Um, I. I must say, uh, I'm very, very happy with my, my Fundsmith funds and I don't advertise them in, in any way, shape or form. I'm not saying you guys should buy it. Uh, why? Because it, it basically gets me my, my, my hit of uh, uh, kind of a fairly broad section, but not too many stocks of, uh, of uh, value stocks that I can understand. 
uh, and it has things like Facebook in it as well. So um, I, I don't really feel the need with value stocks to hold a hundred of them. I'd rather hold 10 good ones uh, than, than a hundred. So for me, I don't really need to have an ETF on that. I don't need to have that kind of diversification on it. Um, Berkshire, I, I do like Berkshire Hathaway. I do. Uh, I think the mortality risk there of management is an issue. Um, and I think a lot of you guys were, were, were shouting that out when I was talking about Berkshire Hathaway last time. And I think that's a fair point. So uh, for me, therefore, I'm, I'm going to hold off a little bit on Berkshire Hathaway. Uh, I think there is a, an, an, a real event driven risk in there, to put it politely, uh, that one of these t uh, older gentlemen will at some point no longer be with us. I'm hoping they'll be with us for a very long time, of course. But, uh, you know, that is a, a risk when your management is in its, its 90s. So I think that's a little bit of a risk there. Um, it's also a lot of Apple, of course. Uh, I like the underlying business. I I also like that it's a lot of cash. It's 50% cash, so I quite like that because there will be an opportunity at some point when these guys will pounce and they'll buy something really fantastic, I think. Um, uh, just home, happy green day, Barber, Pierce, Ferris, absolutely. It is a green Barber day. Uh, we just show you very briefly here, actually, the... Um, this is what the day was yesterday. I mean, it, it, it is kind of as green as it gets, really. Uh, very hard to be invested almost in anything that's red. Well, except for, for Palantir, of course, uh, which is down a little bit, but not massively. Uh, overall, very, very good. Uh, some of the real defensive plays, like utilities, are, are sold off a little bit. Uh, and that makes sense. Consumer defensive not doing too fantastically, but also not too badly either. Stocks like Walmart, etc., cetera, is selling off a little bit here. And we have a little bit of the healthcare stuff. Well, they have had some fantastic days, so that's kind of why. And the big kind of defensive tech plays, Microsoft, Apple, Google, uh, they didn't have the greatest of days. And that kind of makes sense because people are, are now fleeing again out of the safety, jumping back into the market. Uh, let's also have a quick look if there is any significant short interest here. Um, and you can see, so this is now showing us a short interest, uh, all the numbers pretty low. Walmart is massively shorted. I don't really know what that is all about, uh, but it is uh, Neo at 12%. Uh, it's actually pretty low uh, for Neo. And you can see that little, that little chart there that's displaying. It's actually one of the lowest levels it's been at for quite some time. Um, we have uh, Rocket here, pretty high short, but yeah, nothing really on any of the sort of major stocks. Uh, Snow 17%, that's fairly high, but yeah, so market calming down a little bit, right? Airbnb shorted at 16%. Well, I kind of think that is is, is justified given the, the stock price value of that. Uh, but that's just my my bagging on, on, on Airbnb. I'm not a huge fan, if you, you might know. And crypto having a very nice recovery here, almost to back to 60,000 to Bitcoin, 59,000. Is it going to break through 60 again anytime soon? Or is it going to hover back down to the 55 and then take and have another go at it? Uh, well, we we will we'll see on that one. Um, Hong Kong market is, uh, futures are looking very positive. Hong Kong market also about to open. Um, let me see if we are, I've got the numbers yet. Uh, I think not quite yet uh, on, on, on this one. We'll wait a couple of minutes. Uh, did you see this, guys? Baidu is listed on, the, on done their, their listing in Hong Kong, uh, raising 3.1 billion. That's a secondary listing, of course, for, for Baidu. It was a hundredfold oversubscribed on the retail element, which means um, retail investors are going to get up their hands at about 12% of this of this particular piece. Uh, so I think that's, that's a good story there for the tech sector also. Uh, Baidu dual listing and, 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 and doing so. A little bit of a discount, I think, I think one must, must say. Uh, they, they, they did um, offer these at um, a 2.7% discount account to the closing price on Tuesday. Um, and why were they doing that? Well, they were hoping to go a little bit higher, but then of course the tech sector went down quite a bit. But still, I think the, the, the very amount by which this is oversubscribed is, is a positive, and by also having a good day here at 3.8%. Um, so here, here's the headline, uh, Fed saying no need to react to rising treasury yields. And look how stern he looks there. You have to believe the man. Um, guys, if you can look at some some, some more uh, TA, absolutely, uh, do shout them out. Um, I have a new stock I'm starting to look at, personal data selling app, uh, SRAX. Very interesting concept with some recent jumps. One for my risky small punt account, just enough. Okay, thanks for sharing that. A hundred time over sub, absolutely. Um, uh, Hong Kong retail investors have some serious appetite for IPOs at the moment. Um, praise the chairman, when's Neo and Baba going to be available in the mainland, says Pierce. 
So um, Baba isn't yet connected to the southbound connect. So mainland Chinese investors can't buy it directly on their listings. Uh, the, the 9988, that is the share. Uh, there's a rumor that's going to change. If it doesn't change, you'll be the first to know. I'll definitely let you know because for me, that'd be a huge thing. If that could bring something like 6 7% extra money into the stock uh, because a 10 cent is hot held by through by mainland investors through that southbound connect to the tune of about six percent or seven percent so uh, of you know of all, all of 10 cents so that's a pretty substantial one there um uh like for the gentleman uh, jackson thank you very much that's very kind of you don't know what you're talking about for every one of your likes guys i donate one cent to the gentle barn and i donated 308 dollars last month uh, let's make that 500 dollars this month guys come on we can, we can do it all you have to do is hit the like button and, and my money will flow basically uh, now uh, so the short short uh, recap here is basically bond yields uh, went down from the highs yesterday of 1.67 percent or so and now they're sitting uh, snugly at about 1.63 uh, nine here. Um, now, uh, some of you are shouting at some stocks. We can look at some uh, Santheran Raj there. You want to look at, at an NGA. Okay, we can pull that up. Um, Magna. Uh, people have been shouting Magna quite a bit recently. They're having a very nice, uh, very nice rally here, right? Um, now, if you do quite a bit of um, technical analysis, you kind of know that this sort of chart means momentum is good <laughs> basically it's all all up uh, you almost don't need to look at indicators uh, to to tell you that um we had a let me um put that in here so that's the that's the buy signal here uh, on the 1st of february basically that's the last one we have and then ever since uh, we have managed to stay above this red line uh, with a bit of zigzags but basically you know we are heading in that direction so that's a positive story that's the that's the most crooked line i've ever drawn i think so but you know you see uh, our trajectory looking in that direction at the moment uh, uh, Xiong, uh i'll get to your question in just a second thank you um uh, so that is, is looking very positive, much like the stock up there. Uh, where is it struggling with at the moment in terms of, of highs? Uh, well, it actually managed yesterday to break through its all-time high, uh, which I think before, if I'm not mistaken, was at 93.50. Uh, yesterday we went as high as 94, and then we had a little bit of a pullback down to 93.68. So uh, really, I suppose, uh, getting through that 94 mark might kick it off. Uh, and where is it going to kick it off to? Well, I think it'll probably kick it off uh, all the way up to the next resistance line, which is at 99.36 or thereabouts. So uh, very positive um, momentum here on, on, on um, Magna. Now, do always bear in mind T TA's technical analysis um, it predicts kind of human emotion and psychology, I think, very, very successfully. However, it is dumb in the sense that it doesn't read the news. It doesn't know about big outside events. So if, you know, the company announces that, their accounts uh, are not quite right, like a certain company did yesterday, then, you know, it, it, it can't predict that kind of thing. So you have to still pay attention to, to what's going on. And I think one other thing to, to perhaps look at here is that volume is, is falling off a little bit. And, and when it does that, it typically means the, the real rally is fizzling out a little bit and you get a bit of a correction uh, and, and then you might start again. So I, that's one thing I'd look at here. Uh, Hua Xiong here, you're asking, is the, what's going on? We're going, going on a bull run now. I, I think we are going on a very nice tech recovery. I think so. Um, until uh, bond uh, yields creep up again to a level where it worries people. That might be a little bit higher now. Uh, that might be 1.8 or 1.7, 1.8, 1.9. I think then uh, people are going to be jittery again and they're going to be asking uh, Powell for a, for a nightly sermon and to hold our hands and a nice cup of cocoa uh, to, to sort of you know, chide us over again. So I think we are going to need these shots in the arm uh, regularly. But I think the, the way he presented this time was rather smart uh, because he didn't just say, no, no, we're not going to do anything. No, no, inflation isn't going to come. No, 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 I don't believe it. I don't see it. I'm closing my eyes. He, he didn't, didn't do that usual spiel he did. He actually said, look, we are no longer, we are breaking with our old policy. We are no longer preemptively fighting inflation. Uh, and therefore, uh, it buys him time. It basically means he can wait till we have inflation and then he can act. He doesn't have to act. 12 to 18 months in advance of inflation, which is typically uh, what the Fed has been doing well for, for decades, really. So um, uh, it's recovering, absolutely. Um, what at what price uh, would you buy? Okay, you guys talking about a riot here. Um, you bought the Argo blockchain just enough. Interesting, interesting. Um, 
All good visiting Tennessee in in May. Bulls in control next sixty days, says Pierce. Um, I, I think I think we are going to see a, a a nice recovery here from 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 my my perspective. Um, let's have a quick look at uh, the uh, Nasdaq. So if you look a little bit longer term at the Nasdaq here, uh, you know we get these kind of uh, if if you if you see what we had here, just uh, this sell off here is very very similar to you know the one we got in September for example right and we get these and then we go on a rally and then we have another one uh, and that is kind of how the market moves and we've had some smaller ones in fair but we haven't had a big one like that uh, basically since September and then after September we went up went up very nicely and the next rally lasted for well for about a month uh, and I think that might be probably about about right this could power us on for a couple of weeks um, but I think not necessarily for months without kind of more assurance. And I think we need that. Now, the stimulus money is going to, the Joe's checks are going to hit. Uh, if you guys are in the US, do let me know when you get them. I think it'd be interesting for everyone to, to realize around the world uh, when that money is going to hit. And I think quite a lot of that money is going to flow into, into stocks. So um, I think at the moment we are looking at a, a shortish term, uh, a, a, a bull run again uh, for, for, for the NASDAQ. Um, now, the um, S&P 500 is actually has been looking a, a lot smoother, right? You can see that here. In fact, if you want, I could I can add um, them to it. You can get a bit of a feel for how these two parts of um, it's this one uh, of uh, the investment world are, are coinciding. Let me hide a few of these lines because we have far too many lines here on, on at the moment. Uh, for anyone to make head or tails of this. So you can see the Nasdaq, the orange one, has of course outperformed, but it also does it with increased volatility. And if we can go back to our, um, so here's the be beginning of the recovery. Basically, you can see uh, Nasdaq is up 20% more than uh, the more old world S&P 500. Uh, but it does that also with like greater volatilities. If you measure, you know, that one down here, um, in you know in percentage terms essentially and then look at the same correction here uh, from uh, Nasdaq which was you know I don't know nine percent or something like that versus double that on the Nasdaq so you get that higher that increased volatility on the Nasdaq but it also has been bringing us a much higher return so um, uh, Glenn any thoughts on Biden's possible capital gains tax increases well yeah he's talking about lots of capital tax increases right I, I almost wonder, is it, is it a sort of politician's move to throw everything out there? Um, and that's what you see a lot, for example, in, in UK politics, where they kind of announce 10 horrible headlines and then they just do the one. And then everyone thinks, ah, that wasn't as bad as we expected. So uh, he, you know, he's talking about increased corporate taxes, increased taxes for uh, the highest uh, bracket of taxpayers, uh, about 400,000 US dollars, um, capital gains, tax here, lots of things. Um, I think passing tax increases is actually much more difficult than even with a democratic uh, you know house uh, because they still all have to go back and get re-elected and if they were the ones that raised taxes uh, that makes life more difficult um, capital gains taxes um, i think are particularly unproductive uh, I think uh, them raising taxes on the highest bracket of uh, income earners is a more popular move, probably. It affects less people than, quite frankly, most people on high incomes won't be affected by it because they are structure the way, the way their, their income flows to them in, in, in tax-efficient ways. I think that might be a sort of a winner there. However, if he's really looking, I mean, is he really looking to plug the deficit, uh, having just blown 1.9 trillion? I find that quite hard to believe. I don't think he's a deficit hawk here. Um, so I, I think this is more a, a sort of... Um, you know, we are Democrats, we are now in power and we are going to do the sort of political things people expect us to do. And that is, is trying to have a go at uh, reducing inequality. Uh, now, they have just incre you know, increased inequality more than anyone uh, because the money printing increases inequality massively because this goes into assets. The people who hold assets are the more wealthy people. So it is, it is going to create more of a social divide there. And I think um, plugging that gap with a little bit of a tax increase seems, seems unlikely to be effective. I think really the one from the market's point of view to watch out for is uh, corporate tax increases. That would not be great for the market, I think. And then you have to look at who are the highest taxpayers. A lot of the growth stocks, of course, don't pay any tax because they're loss making, right? So a lot of the tech stocks less affected by that, but a lot of the um, genuinely profitable, uh, more value stocks might get hit a little bit there. So um, 
Uh, Austin, you got the check this morning. Fantastic. 12 hours ago. Thank you very much and enjoy. What are you going to do with it, Austin? Do you want to tell us? You, you... Um, Benjamin Nagel, I, I, I love Baba. Yes, it is true. Absolutely. I, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, um, you can't shake it out of me. Uh, PD has some really interesting numbers out yesterday, actually. More active users than Alibaba. You have to give them some real credit for that. Um, though I am less excited about the e-commerce side in the long run uh, than the sort of cloud business, or, although Alibaba's e-commerce business is still uh, fantastically profitable. Um, uh, uh, just now saying taking money from the top to pay for infrastructure for all, not a bad thing. I agree with you on that. And I think the US needs some serious infrastructure spending. And I think that's um, perhaps one thing we can agree with, with, with Trump on that infrastructure spending was is, is, is sorely needed in the US for, for really everything. Um, if you compare US infrastructure, which is largely from the 80s to you know, the newer economies now here in Asia, uh, I think you are you, you are starting to see a serious gap there and the US has to plug that. And that's a government expenditure. Government's expenditure on infrastructure is generally good investment. There's generally a fairly good return on that uh, from a GDP growth kind of point of view. Um, honestly, throwing money at everybody through checks is very unlikely to uh, give them a, a return on that investment uh, because the money goes to a lot of people who don't necessarily need it. And I mean, I'm fantastically happy for you guys. You got that check. Brilliant. Uh, we had some of that uh, here in Hong Kong last year, too. And of course, I'm happy for the money. What do I do with it? I move it into my brokerage account. Uh, but, you know, that doesn't really um, benefit the real economy, right? Because I'm probably buying U.S. stocks with it or, you know, Chinese stocks with it. So it doesn't really benefit the economy. And I think that's kind of the... Um, why the governments are not set up in terms of data to really target their stimulus. Uh, and, and they could do with somebody like Palantir, for example, to run that data for them. And then that you could just give bigger checks to those who actually need it and who will actually spend it. Uh, and I think a lot of that should go to small businesses who um, have genuinely a good business, but are, are affected by, by, by COVID and, and will recover. And all that data is out there, right? Between the tax authorities and you know property records and, and, and employment records, social security records. If you combine all of the data in an intelligent way and use some AI, you could basically pinpoint uh, the people that would you know, make the best use of it. And I'm not saying you guys shouldn't get your checks. I mean, I'm glad you got your checks. Fantastic, Austin. Uh, but I'm just saying from, a, from a spending 1.9 trillion without really getting a return on that. And that would mean you would get the economy to grow by more than that. And I think the economy is going to grow by less than that is, is just untargeted. And that's just where governments are. It isn't just the US issue. So um, have you done much, much research into Teladoc, says Benjamin there? No, I haven't. Um, I have uh, uh, thought about it. I've uh, not really talked about it, but uh, I have not really done any, any, any research into it. Um, these are interesting companies. Let me just get over the Nasdaq here in the background. Uh, wow, pretty pretty steep sell-off, right? Uh, but it is also a pretty steep rally. Um, so it was as high as, what was it? 308 and now sitting at 190. So that's some pretty serious volatility there. Uh, recovering a bit, uh, but yesterday falling off this trend. So we had this nice kind of trend here of, of, of lower highs each day. And then yesterday really falling off um, that... I, I don't know why. Does anybody have uh, the news on Teladoc? Let's see if there is uh, is there a news item here on that. Um, this is on Arc Innovation Continues slide. Actually, I got the email from Arc this morning, and I was thinking, wow, they've bought almost nothing. So money is is flowing out there. I I I, I I'm afraid. Um, they bought, they bought Teladoc yesterday. <laughs> there we go. That connects the story nicely. They bought uh, 78,000 shares of Teladoc yesterday, uh, but they didn't buy a, a lot of other things. So what did they sell? They sold Komatsu and Roku uh, and everything else. They, they just bought two, four, six, eight, ten, eleven 10, 11 shares. Normally they buy about 20 or 30 a day. So I think uh, the outflow is hitting them a little bit there. Um, what's the news on this? Um, yeah, not a lot. I guess people are just perhaps concerned about uh, the 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 uh, innovation sort of sector falling off a little bit here, but no real really timely news on Teladoc okay, that explains why they did what they did yesterday. So, but thanks for shouting that out, uh, Brandon Thatch. Uh, uh, or is that, do I pronounce that right, Brandon? Uh, thank you for your generosity and support. Uh, do you also feel free to join our Discord channel and, and Patreon, guys. Uh, you can do th join our Discord channel through the Patreon below. And then you can get to chat to our, me and our community uh, through the day. And of course, we share lots more information over there uh, as well. 
Uh, Dixon saying Baba is waking up. Yes, it is, uh, though, of course, in the bigger scheme of things, that is still, let me load that up here uh, quickly. Um, actually, what's, 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 what's Hong Kong doing? Uh, let's have a quick look at the Hong Kong markets. Even if you're in the US and you don't invest in anything Hong Kong related, it is still important. Uh, why? Because the markets hand over to each other. We have lots of new listings. And look at Alibaba here up 3.68%. Uh, that is quite nice to see. Uh, the recovery continuing. Ali Health is down a little bit. Okay. I'm still waiting for Ali Health to go back down to 22 so I can buy some. Um, but I've missed missed it the last time. It was at 2250 or something. Um, but look at Hang Seng Index. That is really, really nice and green. Uh, what are our uh, top performers here? Uh, well, the worst ones are pharma companies, a little bit of real estate. Uh, but generally speaking, things are looking very, very green here. Uh, so the platforms like Meitou and Alibaba are, are up. Xiaomi continues to be up. Geely Automobile, which is, of course, a, a, a big EV player also. That is up quite nicely. Uh, 10 cent up. I think PDD's results were pretty good. And I think that's actually lifting the sector. Uh, even banks are up, insurance companies. So just across the board, basically, to sum it up, things are looking very green here in the market. So that's 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 good to see. Uh, thanks for shouting that out. Uh, CH Maximus, you late to the party. Uh, ne ne never mind, you're never too late. Um, thanks for your hard work. Uh, whole positions in Pianti and Neo and looking to open one in Baba tomorrow, says Benjamin. Well, Baba, I would just say, with a, there's a, I do love the business, but I think there's a big caveat. I don't think anything is really going to happen till the end of the year. So you, you need some, some time horizon there. At least that's just my perspective. Uh, you're indicating. Uh, Joel, uh, great to have you on the channel here. Um, uh, here, man says, Teladoc is uh, tumbling. The decline came after Amazon announced plans to roll out its Amazon Care Telehealth service to employees through the US this summer. Ah, okay, hee hee man, you are marvelously well informed, thank you. Uh, so the thought there, I think, to take that one step further would be that once they have rolled that out to their employees, and Amazon has quite a few employees. Um, in fact, I think I have on here how many they have. Uh, where is Amazon on here? Where is that lovely, uh, there's Barber, have we got Amazon on here? Where did Amazon go? Um, then they would, of course, be able to roll that out to the market. Generally speaking, we should have Amazon on our, on our tracker. Uh, here, here it is. So Amazon has uh, 1.29 million employees. So that in itself is, is a pretty sizable in, in, in health insurance market there. And, and it probably makes sense on their point of view. They must be paying quite a lot for, for health insurance. So why not um, do it themselves? And then that would, of course, be a substantial very sizable competitor and they could link that in with Prime, for example, they have huge data. And I think that's one thing to look out for. I think that's probably a good, um, hey, Himan there, thank you very much for, for, for shouting that out. Um, tech businesses still need to develop a moat, right? You have to look at the big giants. They have the data. Right? You know, Amazon has our data. Google has our data. Facebook has our data. Lots of companies, uh, LinkedIn to some extent. Um, if they want to get into a sector, they can do that. There isn't actually that much of a barrier. And that's what I'm saying, for example, with companies like Airbnb. I don't get the valuation because um, every property you're listed on Airbnb is also listed on other platforms. And quite frankly, if Amazon wanted to do it, they could. If Google wanted to do it, they could. If Facebook wanted to do it, they could. Uh, just like that. And they take massive market share away from them. So uh, I think moats are important even in growth stocks. I think that's perhaps uh, the lesson here. Um, uh, Benjamin is saying, looking at Barba as a long-term investment. Um, okay, you don't day trade. Okay, Benjamin, thanks for sharing that. I just wanted to be a little bit uh, cautious on that because I've been holding Barba for some time and it has not been a pretty period. I don't mind because I, I want to hold it for 10 years and I think it is a stock that uh, compounds in the long run, uh, but it, it is a long-term play. There is a lot of politics in there. There's a lot of stuff and news in there and generally the international news is very unflattering. I'd say the China discount it flows almost entirely into Alibaba. So um, all kind of negative sentiment there towards Chinese investment seems to go into that stock for no particular reason. Um, uh, you guys talking about Fibonacci here. Fibonacci is an absolute marvel. I agree with you. Are you topping up Neo at PLTR at the moment, Benjamin? Um, you know what? I haven't been, um, I, to be all perfectly honest with you, uh, because I've got quite a bit of it. And uh, I've been looking at these last couple of weeks of corrections to balance my portfolio a little bit more into the value sector, because I like the growth stocks, um, but as they have grown, they become a bigger part of the portfolio. And really, I, I like to kind of balance things out with stuff that's a bit more um, calm. And something like a Facebook, for example, to me is a little bit more calm or a PayPal uh, because they are everyday kind of must-have services regardless of what's going on with the economy. 
Um, IPNFF is your NFT crypto play, Matty. Interesting. We've been talking quite a lot about NFTs uh, in, 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 on our Discord crypto channel. Uh, I, I'm, I'm absolutely intrigued by it. I've been studying how it works. I'm thinking about making my own, uh, but I think the uh, it isn't that popular a subject on YouTube. So uh, we have to see what happens there. Uh, what is important in growth stocks? Uh, could you repeat again, says Dan. Uh, uh, gladly, Dan. I'm just saying that growth stocks, like all stocks, need to develop a moat. By moat, I mean a barrier to entry. They need to have something that makes it hard for others to enter their market. So if you take um, you know, a PayPal, for example, uh, PayPal has a moat in the sense that they have us all signed up. We all have our bank accounts linked up, verified. They are um, have, I don't know, 50 million or something uh, merchants that accept the payment method. To roll that out and to build that up is pretty expensive, right? So uh, there is that visibility. And there's also the brand. Branding can be a moat. Like one of Apple's biggest moats is basically their brand loyalty. Um, if you look at... Um, Something like Alibaba, for example, what's the mode? Well, I think 55% market share to an extent is a mode because it just means you are quite dominant. Um, their subscription business, so their prime Amazon Prime type business is a mode because once I'm paying for it, say Amazon Prime, to go back to the Amazon example, I'm quite likely to buy everything on Amazon because I get free shipping or faster shipping. Uh, I'm not really going to go on another website, even if the product there is a dollar cheaper because I'm just in my Amazon Prime world. And I think with some of the very highly valued sort of growth stocks that we're seeing, um, I, I don't see any attempt of a moat. And, and for me, Airbnb is one of those cases. And I, I've used the service. I think it's fantastic. But if you look at um, any of their properties that are listed also on booking.com, on One Fine Stay, or lots of them, depending on, on each country and region, there might not be quite a worldwide one that is as big as, as, as Airbnb, but there is plenty of local competition. And basically, Google search allows you to pretty much search that uh, apartment you're, you're renting and, and find it listed on two or three other sites. And, and all the property guys I know who use Airbnb basically list their properties on multiple sites and they don't care when where the booking comes from. So I think that is a sort of business that is, is that is quite hard for them to really develop a mode. Now you could say, well, they have a big user base. Yes, they do, but Google does, Amazon does, Facebook does, LinkedIn does. You know, there are, there are a lot of businesses that actually have that user, user base. So is Facebook announced a, a sort of Airbnb type business tomorrow? Well, they take market share from, from, from Airbnb very, very easily. So I don't think there is a huge barrier anymore to that. Now, Airbnb built that industry, and it's a little unfair in a sense, because they went around, they signed people up, and that was quite expensive for them. Uh, but now that everyone's in on it, everyone just puts their properties on everything. So, you know, that's kind of, uh, to, to illustrate the point there. Um, Peter Thiel, PayPal plus PLTR, Genius, CP, I, I agree with you on that, yes. And, and I think um, it's nothing to do with politics, guys, about Peter Thiel. This is just to do with, with good companies. Um, uh, Dan, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm glad my, my, my rant here makes some sense. Um, uh, Matty says penny stocks are ready again. Yeah, there probably will be some of that going on again to, to today. Uh, One Fine Stay is a bloody great business name, uh, just enough. It is, it is. Um, as a business, again, I have the same issues with, with them, with, with Airbnb. Uh, it is a sort of premium Airbnb. Um, perhaps it has a little bit more customer loyalty there, they have a bit more service. Uh, but really, it is it is uh, interchangeable with, say, Airbnb. So um, are you loading up BFARF tomorrow? What was BFARF? BFARF. Bit farms. Okay. This is a uh, crypto stock. How's that going? That's a pretty, pretty nice rally. <laughs> what happened here? What happened on the 28th of December? That gave us a high of 10 and a low of 1.96. Okay, so volatility is certainly the name of the game. But yeah, from a momentum point of view, just at a one a quick glance, it looks uh, fairly positive, though volume is coming off a little bit in this rally here. So I'd watch out uh, for, for, for volume there, guys. Um, let's have a quick look at uh, Hong Kong again. Are we still looking uh, green and, and sunny? Yes, we are. Uh, that is very nice to see. Alibaba now up 3.86% here. Uh, everything looking pretty hunky-dory there. Um, how long before we see Airbnb and the like start purchasing their own inventory of homes, says CH Maximus? Well, that would make it more interesting, right? So at the moment, Airbnb is, is valued at an absolute multiple of, say, um, you know, Marriott or Hilton. 
who don't really own their properties. Uh, they are property developers that own them, but they have long-term management contracts to have access to them. They probably own some of the older hotels, but generally speaking, hotel companies don't own the physical properties. They just manage them. But that is a, um, you know, if you own, if you're the property owner and you own a building and it's a high, you know, the grand hired manager, you're fairly unlikely to kick them out because they're going to do a pretty good job. Uh, and if you gave it to, you know, Hilton or something, they probably wouldn't do a much better job. So there's a, there's a serial stickiness there. Um, if Airbnb started acquiring properties, well, the difficulty with that is that it is tens of thousands of individual apartments often or, or houses, they're not together. So the cost of managing that is pretty substantial because it's basically a hugely scattered property portfolio from lots and lots of uh, small you know, retail uh, uh, property owners and some professional owners and some management companies. And it's a real mix in there. So it is more efficient to buy one building and run it as a hotel. Uh, than to buy, you know, 100 apartments in different cities, different countries, in different time zones and that sort of thing. So I think from a management point of view, I think that's quite hard for them. I don't think that's really going to be their, their business model. They could do a bit of it. Say they could do open an Airbnb serviced apartment building in, in, in say, in New York or in LA or somewhere like that. Of course, they could do that. But then that they would, would essentially get them into the hotel business. I don't know if they want to be in that. Because then they take the risk of empty inventory, right? At the moment, they take no risk. Uh, so that's the, the beautiful part of the business is that they just get fees. They don't worry about anything. So at the moment, they're not getting many fees, but their costs are fairly low uh, because they're not looking after those properties. It's the property owners that are taking the risk that they are, they are empty. So um, property is a long-term one, uh, one of the safe investments, but you have massive staffing costs. Just enough, I, precisely what I just said. I, I think as a management, property management company, that's probably not one way of going about it. Um, uh, <laughs> Justin, enough. I, I I agree with you there on that uh, that Bitcoin stock that we were just looking at there. B F A R F. Uh, Justin, almost zero zero liability. Absolutely, CH maximum. Excellent. Thanks, guys. If you have any questions, guys, do shout them out. Uh, now now is the time. Um, uh, Hong Kong looking very very good here. But just do a very quick recap on what the Fed did yesterday, guys. Uh, basically, the Fed announced a break in historic policy. Uh, in in the past, they have been fighting inflation preemptively. So in advance of inflation actually rearing its head, they'd fight it. Why? Um, economic theory and statistics have always been if you raise interest rates now, that takes effect maybe in 12 to 18 months. So therefore, they were doing stuff in advance. And the Fed Chairman Powell said to us yesterday, we're no longer going to do that. No, we won't. We won't fight inflation preemptively. We're going to wait for it to actually appear. Uh, and that is a real big change in, in, in policy. And people have bought that. The market has swallowed it up. If you look at any of the charts from yesterday, you basically see that from two o'clock onwards, uh, the market uh, turned uh, beautifully green. Uh, so if you, this is um, Neo yesterday. Here's two o'clock. Can you see two o'clock? Uh, that is two o'clock when, when when Powell started opening his mouth, and that's when we started flying. Uh, before that, we were looking fairly bleak in the morning. If you joined us for that, um, Rich is saying, "New follows Tesla. What about XPAP and Lee? Um, they also do." So if we can put them all, why don't we do that for for for, for a laugh? We put them all in here together. And you can judge for yourself. So we'll. This is uh, the main one here. Is is is, is Tesla. Uh, I'm gonna add. Uh, I'll do it all on the same percentage scale. Uh, and then here's Lee, and here is Xpeng. Um, and you can see that all the lines. So the, the green colorful one is is Tesla, and the other ones are the blue one is Lee. Um, a little bit uh, underperforming here. Well, why? It's a more conservative business, quite frankly, uh, to the other ones. Uh, that's that's the way they're run. I can also hide the volume for you guys. So you can see that here. That's just yesterday, right? That is yesterday during the day. You see how closely they are correlated. Now, let's look at this on a little bit more of a longer term basis. Now, you will, of course, then see some um, on this very long term scale, you see Neo outperforming. But if we go back a little bit more in, into sort of recent history, say from, from August onwards, um, when they are moving more in, in tandem. So Neo basically did in about a year what Tesla did in 10 years in terms of price increase there because Tesla had done that for them. So that's that's Tesla pulling up Neo. But look at these three here. I mean, you know, talk about correlation, right? It is it is very substantially correlated. It, there is a little bit of a stronger correlation between the three Chinese uh, EVs. So Neo up here, you see it, it sells off and then you see that Xpeng does it and Lee does it. Uh, well, in that period, Tesla didn't actually. Tesla moved up. So um, those are then specific China-related 
uh, kind of new story. So I would say Tesla moves the whole industry and I would say Neo moves Xpang and Li. That's kind of how I see the strata of these with Li probably being at the at the bottom of that of that pile. So uh, I, I think it's pretty obvious to see very, very strong correlation here from, from these three. Um, Obviously, some some differences occasionally, uh, but you know, in, in in the long term, look at this on a shorter term basis here. This is now since sort of December uh, and very very similar charts, right? So uh, Neo and Tesla outperforming the other two. That's true, and I think that might continue to happen, uh, but still on a on a kind of movement direction, very 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 similar, right? Um, uh, Benjamin, you are first time investor establishing a US portfolio based in Australia. Uh, uh, welcome there, Benjamin. Thanks for your questions earlier. Uh, what would you recommend looking at? Currently, you own Neo and Palantir, Benjamin. Uh, look, I, I can't give you specific kind of uh, investment advice as always, guys. This is for entertainment. This is not advice. Uh, I, I would look at diversification, to be honest with you. I, I think I'd probably throw in um, either a good mutual for a fund, uh, and for that, I would look at very low fees. That's really the absolute requirement, or a good ETF. And I would go into some different sectors. I think a 100% tech portfolio is great, but it gives you huge volatility. So you have to really think about that, um, whether you want some things in there that are perhaps not moving quite as, as quickly. Um, and um, you know something like a Facebook or a PayPal, for example, I don't move as quickly, but you're still in on tech if you're gonna go into tech. Um, uh, but yeah, there are, there are quite, there's quite a lot of options out there. I think in terms of, um, I, I, I personally, I like to have some high growth. I like to have some value stuff. Um, and, and then throw a few other things in the mix that I think are exciting for that particular time. Um, things like PLTR um, and, and, and NEO are kind of in a similar area, right? They're both basically growth. They're both tech. Uh, they're both kind of essentially software companies. Uh, I don't think NEO is really a car company in that sense, the way it's valued. So I, I think um, what I'd look at is uh, do a little bit of digging on compounding. And there's some really good literature on that, both online and, and, and in books. And that explains a little bit, I think, the, the beauty of uh, having some uh, value-driven stocks in there. Because if you have uh, companies that are making, you know, 20, 30, 40% a year uh, a return on their on their in, uh, capital or even 60% uh, for, for that matter, matter, that just compounds very nicely. And it might not give you that 100% spike, but it might still give you 10, 20% or so a year, which is still, still quite a nice thing to have in there. So I, I would just say, Benjamin, from my point of view, uh, I would diversify. I think I think that just, um, and by diversify, I mean, if you buy these four stocks here, you haven't really diversified. You see, you see what I mean? Because they are moving in the same direction. So I like to buy some things also that are moving in opposite directions. Um, uh, better to Tesla and any divergence from it will be interesting just enough. There'll be a point where they diverge as they mature as just enough. And I think you are right. I think they will. Um, as the market, first of all, I think the market has to understand these stocks a bit better uh, rather than just going, oh my God, it's EV, it's exciting. And uh, look at the car, it's shiny. Wow. Um, and that's a little bit what, what I think a lot of investors are doing at the moment. So they are just buying kind of the sector. And that's a fair way of doing it. But eventually, I think people will differentiate more uh, between not just these four, but you know, also others. Um, so the more EV companies we get out there and the more the EV market matures and the bigger the market share is, I think people will look at them quite differently. I don't think people look at you know, Toyota, GM and BMW in the same way, just think, ah, oh, it's all the same, just, just throw some money at it. So I think we will get there, but it'll take a little bit of time. Magnificent Life, he says, Volkswagen stock jumped 30% uh, percent today because of their planned forecast in the EV sector. You share your analysis on Volkswagen stock. I'd love to know what you think about uh, VW. says Magnificent Life there. That's an interesting one, isn't it? Let me pull that up here. Uh, Volkswagen, uh, that is the US one. Uh, let's have a look if we can get the, the German listing. That's uh, Vorzugsaktien, etc. I think that's what we want. Is it? Uh, which one do we want, guys? You see how often I trade German stocks, and I'm German. It's shameful, isn't it? Uh, well, anyway, let's let's look at that uh, chart here. You can see the jump, and I'll I'll hide uh, our uh, little comparison pals here. Uh, so. Volkswagen has, if you can look at history, had a, a bit of a bumpy ride. Uh, let's go back a, a little bit here. Um, not the greatest performing stock of all time, right? We are now looking at um 2015 for example so um if you had bought this in 2015 or 2014 you'd be well basically where you started over a uh, you know seven six seven year period so pretty pretty appalling returns there 
but uh, they have uh, recovered. Uh, they are, I think, turning things around. I do think they are going to put out, they already have put out some pretty good EVs. Uh, the battery day, we watched it. If you want to uh, have a bit of a laugh, uh, play back that, that life, it's on our, my, my playlist. Um, it was a, an amusing presentation in the sense that the presentation was really pretty awful, I must say. Um, it it took two and a half hours. It was a chemistry lesson. It was a physics lesson. It was a, an open beg for subsidies and government support and all sorts of stuff. Uh, and it was very, very, very slow, I must say. So uh, that has me thinking two things. One, I think fundamentally they have very smart people. They have lots of great engineers. Uh, they have a plan. They have access to essentially unlimited capital um, and they have a great sales network. And that's the, the hardest thing to build up. It's a, it's a great sales network and loyal customers. So if they make, you know, which they already done, you know, the Golf and E-Golf and, 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 and all of the Audi cars, e, e, uh, you know, EVs, etc., people will still buy them. People will simply buy them. So I think they will, will more or less maintain their market share uh, of the overall car sector. They will just switch them to EVs. They have some challenges, and I think the pace at which they're doing it is a little bit slow, quite frankly. I think they are late to the party. They're now making it sound like they aren't, but I think they are. And I think that's a little bit the, the, the challenge for these massive companies. And why are they slow to the party? Well, if you make an EV, an EV has, say, a thousand parts, and ICE has, say, 10,000 parts. So you need, you need smaller factories, you need less employees. Uh, and of course, somebody like Volkswagen is highly unionized, state, state governments in there, all that stuff. So it brings you just lots and lots of issues. You're kind of uh, closing down your business to open a new one. That's kind of this, this, this conversion. So it's a, it's a tough one. But uh, I, I do think they're going to do well. I, I actually think that is probably quite a good EV play, a little bit more of a conservative EV play, uh, but I do think they are going to do well. They are getting some really quite positive press out of their battery day. Um, although those of us who have watched it, and I know some of you on, on the chat here did, um, they did see uh, the kind of struggle that they have there internally. Uh, but uh, I think especially in Europe, I think they're going to do well. In China also, they are the biggest car brand in China, Volkswagen, so they are going to build a uh, tons of EVs in China, and they will continue with that with that uh, market share there, I think, more or less. So uh, Tesla will nick a little bit of it, but not that much, because a lot of the um, the VWs are just, you know, well-priced, reliable, not particularly sexy cars. I think that's kind of their sort of positioning from the Volkswagen brands. Of course, they have, you know, Porsche and all of that, uh, and, and that's all happening. So uh, I, I think they have a lot a long way to go. I think they have a lot of money to spend. I think they're going to go through some years of some pretty unpleasant financial numbers because when they don't, when they sell an EV, it means they don't sell an ICE. Uh, that means their margin falls. So um, it's it's a tough turnaround for them. But I think they they're, they're doing it, and I'm glad they're doing it. Uh, and, and I think they will do a good job of it in the long run. That's my my my, my rather long rant on that, guys. So uh, thanks very much for that question. There, magnificent life. Um, uh, Piers is saying, yes, the, the China-US meeting is, is, is coming up. Uh, what's my take on that? I, I have no expectations for that, honestly. The fact that they are meeting is a huge um, boon, I think, for me. Uh, just them talking changes this whole um, atmosphere, takes the whole aggression thing down a notch. Uh, do I expect uh, them to agree on anything? Not really. I think they're just going to agree to keep talking. I think that's pretty much all that's going to come out of that. Uh, and I think that's a step in the right direction. We saw them, uh, you know, uh, the US is imposing some more sanctions on some Hong Kong officials here and things like that. So Biden isn't really as soft as we thought he might be. He doesn't want to be appear to be soft. He wants to get re-elected. He doesn't want to be the guy that was soft on China. So he's, I think, very wary of that. And therefore, I don't really have any expectations on that particular meeting. But the fact that it's happening it, it is a good thing. So um, uh, marijuana stocks are the climate saying uh, are they uh, most likely to win during legalization? Um, hmm. I mean, the whole sector has been incredibly um, volatile, really, hasn't it? Um, I've been doing digging on that every year or every other year. I always keep looking at that and think this is so exciting. And then you look at the valuations of the better companies and they're insane. Um, they're basically building in legalization. And it really depends on, well, first of all, what is the real political impetus on a federal level to legalize? There are still a lot of people who don't like the thought of it. And uh, Biden seems to be actually a fairly conservative guy. And that might have something to do with his age. 
Um, the other issue with legalization is that a lot of these companies are Canadian, right? Uh, and the way the legalization so far has worked out that you need to essentially set everything up again locally. So I, and this is, I'm, I'm sort of generalizing, but I think if you are, uh, you know, moving as a Canadian company to say into Florida, you have to basically grow the stuff locally. You have to process it locally, all that sort of stuff. So there isn't really a huge um, uh, saving in there for you to be the biggest because you just have to duplicate your structures again and again in different states and different countries. So I think it still has quite a long way to go. I think Mariana stocks are relatively expensive. Uh, I would personally look for the ones with the biggest moat again, who has an actual moat and what product is really differentiated, who has the best brand and actual brand loyalty and um, perhaps uh, look more at the shovels. I think for me, it's more the shovel businesses in there that are more interesting than at the moment, the actual brand. So. Um, uh, just enough, you, you mentioned a good, very good point for Benjamin, uh, look at the uh, exchange rate. Uh, I think you're absolutely cor correct. If, you're, uh, if the Australian dollar, if the Aussie dollar goes up, you basically are earning less money if you, if you are largely invested in US dollars. So absolutely, I think that's a very good point that just enough uh, exchange rates are a big item. Um, VW, big trouble in the EV sector has got a, uh, uh, so you're saying the ID4 has lots of problems there a years away from the tech has got a, I think what we saw on the battery day, I don't think they are at the sort of real forefront of the tech. Um, they are largely looking for the cheaper batteries because they're freaked out by the cost of batteries, quite frankly. I think it was pretty pretty transparent. So they are going to go for the uh, not super performing uh, batteries there. And they're basically uh, going to roll out more uh, charging networks and, and they're begging the government for, for some subsidies there. Uh, but I do think you can't underestimate somebody like VMW. You know, they make Porsche also stuff. They are pretty much the brightest engineers in the car sector. And, you know, look at NEO, for example, where, they, where are they uh, doing all their battery development research? Well, they're doing it in Germany. They're doing it in Munich because that's where, where the knowledge sits. So um, I think VW has access to that and they have the money to do that. So I, I wouldn't write them off. Um, Apple partnership rumors. Oh my God, we have an Apple partnership rumor with every car manufacturer in the world. So uh, I, I would not pay that much attention to that. Uh, CH, you're still laughing about battery day. Yeah, that was that was really quite a comedy performance. Remember that robot just sort of moving about and no one was, was commenting on it. There was just this little little robot, a sort of, you know, R2-D2 just moving around the platform for an unexplained reason for about two and a half hours. So they told us that this was a, a, a charging device that you could have in an underground car park uh, that thing drags a battery and it would just then go up to your car and charge it, which is actually quite a clever technology. But they just had us looking at this thing for two hours going, what is going on there? So um, the VW chart is like a Chinese state company, says Piers. It isn't the prettiest chart. Absolutely. I agree with you that. Um, uh, just enough. That should be their slogan. Reliable, but not particularly sexy. You know what? A lot of people want to buy that. Uh, trust me. I mean, a lot of people are looking at exactly that. Affordable, reliable, not particularly sexy. I think that's that's pretty much uh, <laughs> the business model there. Um, I think I just asking about Neo. Okay, we can have a look, another look at the chart in a second. Um, uh, SNDL expecting a 27% upswing on earnings tomorrow, says Foxhound. Yeah, those earnings are out. I thought really thought they were out actually uh, today. Obviously not yet. I will do some coverage on that, guys, SNDL. I think it is an interesting one. Uh, so I will I will have a look at those earnings. Um, let, let's, I'll have a look at when they are. We might even do a live on that if they are at a reasonable hour. Uh, th thanks very much for sharing that, Foxhound. Uh, can you have a quick look at FBRX? All right. Um, they turned the market green for St. Patrick's Day. Yes, it, it must be that. Um, just that reminded me of the film, The Black Hole. <laughs> okay, just enough. Uh, that's pretty funny. Uh, okay, you wanted me to look at uh, FBRX. Four tight, Forte Biosciences. Okay, I, I know nothing about this company personally. I can only tell you uh, what the technicals are saying here uh, from a, whoops, from uh, a, a sort of this perspective here, we are roughly moving upwards, very volatile yesterday. So we went really high up yesterday to 31 and then we closed at 27. Um, let's have a look at um, Fibonacci. So we touched here at 24 and we are struggling to break through that line here. What's that line? Uh, we're basically struggling to get through 28.88, which is our next resistance line upwards. Let's have a quick look at some. Um, so Williams R gives us a sell signal here. 
so that's something interesting to note. Uh, basically, if you put in a horizontal line here, guys, uh, then you basically you, you cross it from above to, to below. It gives you a cell signal here. So uh, that is not the greatest of, 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 of positive momentum here. Uh, let's have a quick look at MACD. That's still on a buy, but MACD does lag. So I wouldn't pay huge amounts of attention to that. So I do think here yeah, probably these three days sell off in a row. Uh, although yesterday was um, not, you know, almost the same as the day before uh, and a slightly higher low. Uh, so it might indicate a bit of a, a bit of a, a recovery here. Perhaps this is going to move more sideways than, than downwards. Uh, that's my, my quick take on that. Uh, actually, what's volume doing? Let's have a quick look at volume. Uh, volume yesterday was through the roof. What happened yesterday with, with Forte? Was there some massive news item out on that? Let's have a quick look. Um, where's our news? Our news is here. No, that's from October. That's not that. Obviously, there's something going on there that I don't know about. So shout it out if you know. Uh, CBAT uh, earnings are coming soon, says Pierce. Okay, we can have a look at that too. Uh, CBAT earnings. Uh, okay, guys, if there is, I basically, I make this content for you, for guys, for the community. So if there are stuff you are really interested in, uh, let me know. Shout it out. Put it in the comments. Uh, tell me on the Discord. And... Um, you know, we're still laughing here about uh, about the Volkswagen's presentation. Yeah, it, it was a bit of a shocker, really, wasn't it? Uh, but it was entertaining. At least you guys made it entertaining. Uh, so uh, Vignesh asking us about Neo. So let's have a quick look at that. I think uh, a lot of people are are probably here for Neo. Uh, now I've put the ten-year Treasury yield up here. That's why that chart's looking funny. Let's make that a proper chart again. Now, what have we got here? Well, uh, our momentum is actually looking pretty. Good. So let's look at some indicators here. Williams R. Uh, you know, we got that buy signal on the 11th of March here. Let me magnify that for you guys. That blue line, when it crosses that thin dotted line in the middle, that is basically the buy signal. And we're still moving, up, moving upwards. Yesterday, you can see that uh, momentum it's creating there. It's turned around, the fizzling out into positive momentum again. Um, yesterday, the volume, uh, let's see that little green bar there, was pretty good. I could probably zoom in a little bit on this to make this a bit bigger for you guys. Um, where my green arrow is pointing, uh, so we have a positive day with higher volume than on the two sell-off days before. That's good news also. Uh, and the indicators, even things like MACD, who lag a little bit, we got a buy signal here on the 12th of March, uh, which would be here, and it continues to give us a positive momentum. Uh, now, our moving averages are also on here in the background. And for that, I'm going to have to zoom in. Okay, otherwise, you can't make this out, especially if you are on a phone or a sort of smaller tablet or something. Uh, so you see here in the background, there's that red line from above and the blue line from below. When they meet, uh, we get a buy signal, when they cross, rather. So when that blue line crosses from below through the red line, it gives us a buy signal. Like up here, it gave us a sell signal. And, and you know, that was quite the sell signal, right? So uh, that might be a catalyst if we cross through that uh, in the next trading day. Um, I basically was saying yesterday or so that we, I think we are going to move here in my, my little purple area here. Uh, and that is basically between about 42.76 and 46 dollars. That's sort of where I see this moving sideways a little bit. Uh, but if we get a bit more of a catalyst, and certainly the Fed yesterday was a catalyst, we might get that buy signal here. Uh, we have a chance of breaking out above uh, 45, 46 dollars. Uh, but at the moment, I am still a little bit cautious on this. I think um, for the moment, I still see us trading below 46 dollars here in, in, in the near term. So. Um, Please take a look at uh, uh, at Futu. Okay, we can do that. Futu. I think valuation's pretty pretty steep there, uh, Kim. For 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 Futu, uh, PLTR. Of course, we can also do that. Um, uh, I, I sound like Nick Kroll. Okay, that's 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 funny. That's good. Uh, Neo on a weekly time frame. Oh, I haven't got quite the the magic ball yet. Uh, I, I, honestly, I would say I I would have us between uh, basically. Um, let me let me let me draw that in here. I I would have us at this point between forty six dollars and and forty one dollars. That's kind of where I'd have us. There is a chance we could break out of it. Momentum at the moment is looking good, but it's been so volatile and up and down uh, with everything that's going on. Um, and it of course depends on, on on Tesla. You saw Tesla had that little crash yesterday. Uh, that's not good. I mean, it's a tiny item. Of course, it doesn't matter in the long run. And I'm not bagging on Tesla here, but I posted that. Actually, one of our members sent it to me yesterday. Uh, this is on NBC News. Um, they had this crash here. So in, on autopilot, um, the, a, a, a Tesla hit 
a state trooper car, which is really not a very smart <laughs> move from the AI there. Uh, and, and the problem with these kind of things is that's going to be our our resistance to moving to full you know uh, self-driving. Um, you know, you have probably yesterday a hundred people hitting trees and and walls uh, asleep at the wheel, and that doesn't make the news. But one Tesla hitting uh, one thing it does make the news, and that's the, the the challenge I think here. And that sort of thing could impact uh, stock prices because it could slow down the rollout of full autonomous driving. And why is that important? Well, we are valuing Tesla and NEO basically on the on the basis of their future subscription revenue from that, from autonomous driving. Uh, I don't think we really care about how many I mean, the cars they sell or the margin on that particularly. It's, it's, it's nice, but really the, the actual valuation sits in the, uh, in the, in the full self-driving. Uh, so this kind of thing isn't great for getting regulatory approvals, right? Uh, don't hit stage troopers. I think that's something that they have to teach the AI there. Um, we don't know why. I mean, I'm sure Tesla will come out with some explanation, uh, but uh, it is a little bit of a bump in the road. So that's why I'm, I'm a little bit a cautious at the moment and not just for that but just to see how the market is it goes if the market continues to look very very bullish and let's have a look at our um, nasdaq futures are up uh, well that is up 0.3 percent so we're not seeing a massive um, a, a, a bull signal there so i think uh, for me that's kind of where i see us at the moment between 41 and 46 uh, we could go i have higher uh, resistance lines up here 47 49 etc uh, but uh, you have to also bear in mind that a quarter two numbers are not going to be massively glowing because of the chip shortage and battery shortage um, march numbers uh, i think could be quite good i think they're is a good chance they could beat January numbers. So that would make March the best month yet. That could be a little bit of a catalyst for the stock. Uh, but I think overall, uh, this whole sector is, is is a little bit flat at the moment. And uh, that's kind of my, my view on that here. Um, uh, Tesla insurance. Yes, I do like Tesla insurance. I think that is a good business. Absolutely. Um, and I think, you know, Neo also has an insurance business. I think they're all doing that and that makes sense uh, for them. It's also good for cash flow, quite frankly. Uh, you, you can sit on that, on that money. Um, uh, business is talking about uh, M2 money velocity data on, 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 uh, on, the, on the Fed. You think it could cause issues? Could inflation be bad for Neo? Um, so inflation affects growth companies more, most, not the companies, but the valuations, because uh, they are valued on a discounted cash flow model. So we look at, say, five years out uh, valuation, and then we, we basically uh, discount it back to a present value. And in that calculation, inflation is a big factor. So the higher the inflation is, the more it affects that. I don't really think we are going to get inflation. I think uh, the velocity of, of M2 is, is still pretty low. Um, we can pull that up here. So uh, M2 velocity here, um, you know, look at that. It, it, it's just falling, falling off basically. Um, and, and hang on, these are, are my moving average lines, but you can see that little dotted line there. I'll make that an actual line. So that's the, uh, basically the speed at which money turns around and it's falling off while at the same time um, M2, which is the actual supply of money in, in, in circulation, is, uh, is, is going through the roof, right? So that's the story here. That's why you don't see inflation because that money, where does it go? It goes into assets, it goes into Wall Street, it goes into crypto, it goes into real estate, it doesn't go into normal people's pockets. Uh, therefore, um, the stimulus doesn't cause inflation on that particular measure, um, I think, guys. Um, uh, CH is saying 140 viewers have a chance to help out fluffy creatures with a thumbs up. Yeah, that's true, guys. If you hit that like button, I will donate one cent to the gentle barn here. We did $308 in February, uh, and, uh, and I'm hoping we're going to smash that number quite substantially for March, guys. So I uh, appreciate everybody who hits that like button. And do, of course, also uh, hit the subscribe button if you enjoy uh, my, my lives and our TAs during the day. Uh, lots of news um, on, on Neo EVs, Baba Tech, all sorts of things that are interesting. Uh, some macro things as well. Um, uh, Mr. Z is saying, Coupang is doing terribly. Um, uh, yes, I think if you watch my, uh, my pre-IPO, um, pre a video which was not perhaps the most flattering. I do like the business and the company, but I think the valuations are uh, are blown out. Uh, so um, uh, Coupang is is not having a good time of it. I think they just priced it too high, quite frankly. I, I just don't think uh, the company um, quite merits that. I think they're probably priced at about forty percent uh, too high. Let's uh, get some candles up here. So that's that's the last uh, five days of trading. Not a great day, right? But you know. The, the backers, the private equities guys, collected some serious cash. So they are all happy, basically. Um, uh, 
Uh, right, guys. Uh, guys, I really appreciate you all, you all joining here. I, I, I love this community we're building. Thank you so much. I'm going to wrap this up here from Hong Kong. Um, I really appreciate you joining in. Make sure you are subscribed. Make sure you turn on those alert bells. When there is breaking news, I go live and then you get the notifications. Otherwise, you don't. You simply miss the videos because the YouTube algorithm is a fickle one. So uh, thank you very much. Um, TA on Barber Benjamin. I, I did do one yesterday. Watch out for more. There is a tech video that's up uh, a couple of hours ago. You can you can watch the Barber TA there um, and, and, and look at that, Benjamin. So have a look on that. Uh, thanks very much for tuning in, everybody. It's a wrap here from Hong Kong. Have a lovely day wherever you are a good trading day if you are on Asian times. Uh, Hong Kong uh, stock market looking absolutely glorious here. Alibaba at the moment up 4.4%. Who knew they were capable of that? So thanks very much for tuning in, guys.